So one of the common applications of logs in chemistry is taking an exponential function that comes in in the form of the data that we collect and converting that into a linear function or a line function. So this is called linearizing exponential function using logs. As you'll see, if you're taking general chemistry too, in the example of chemical kinetics, there is a lot of data that we collect in chemistry that shows an exponential relationship. So if you plot it, it will look something like this. Okay, just as we highlight highlighted earlier, that's what these exponential functions tend to look like. So what we want to do a lot of times with these things is we want to convert them to a linear function, so something that looks like a line. So as you'll see at the end of this discussion, that function, our goal is to make it look more like this function right here, something that is a straight line. And the reason is because most of the time when we're collecting data that comes in in this form, our goal is to figure out how to fit that data. Fitting a data just means that you are trying to match the scatter of these data points to some kind of a known mathematical function, okay? But because once you have an actual equation, you can then model the behavior of that system with that mathematical equation. And that is what we do in the natural sciences, right? So this process is called data fitting. You might recall that this was discussed in general chemistry one as well. And if you've taken any kind of uh, physics or biology courses, you've seen something like this being done with, with different types of data. Now, the question is, why do we need to switch the form from an exponential into a uh, linear form like this? And the reason is because many times it's a lot easier to model or to fit the data when it's in the linear form, when it's in line form, as opposed to in the exponential form. So for example, here's the same data that we obtain. So for example, one of the experiments that will yield data that looks like this would be when you measure the reactant concentration, which is given the symbol A here, as a function of time. If that chemical reaction occurs using what we call first order kinetics, then you get this relationship where as you run the reaction, the concentration of that reactant is going to decrease, but it's going to decrease following an exponential relationship. And so our interest is to try to figure out how to fit this data with specific parameters so that we'll get something that fits all the data points here, right? So you can see here, I'm highlighting an example of fitting that with three different exponential functions. So I have a blue one, I have a green one, and I have a red one. So the green one sort of fits it well at the beginning, but doesn't fit it well at the end because it sort of goes this way, whereas the data point goes this way. The blue one doesn't fit it very well at the beginning but it fits it pretty well at the end. So it sort of mimics that a latter part pretty well, but not so much at the beginning. And then the red one overall is a little closer, but none of it is actually landing on the data points themselves. So this is, by the way, it's a very common issue we see in fitting. You're not always going to get a perfect mathematical function that would be able to capture your data, right? But that's exactly what we would be doing in an actual experiment. So it turns out that it's a lot easier to do this if we can and change the shape of this data distribution into a linear distribution instead. And a linear distribution, of course, has its own form of equation. So this is the generic form of an exponential function. Y is equal to A, which is just a constant, times E to the power of Bx. And you recall that a line equation has the following form. Y is equal to mx plus B. Just a note, M here is what we call the slope of the line. And the B here is what we call the y-intercept of the line, right? So that B is it's not the same as this b here in the exponential function. They're just a letter that's used to represent these constants. Keep in mind that in the exponential function, you know, when we write the exponential function in this form, the y and the x are our data, right? So those are the things that we actually measure in an experiment with the x being your independent variable and the y being your dependent variable. So for example, like in the case I was mentioning earlier with concentration of reactant and time, so the time is your independent variable and you want to see how reactant changes as a function of time in this case. So a or your y axis axis here is your dependent variable. The a and the b in this exponential function are just constants. They're things that 
create a certain shape for that plot. As I mentioned earlier, when I talk about this, like I say, if you add a number here at the beginning of this and you add another number for the exponent, the shape of this plot is going to change. So similarly, this plot might look like this, given a certain combination of A and B. If you change the A and B, it might have a different exponential shape as a result, right? So these are all just adjustments to the function, but they are things that we want to know because usually finding those constants tell us something about the systems that we are studying, specific properties unique to that system. The question then becomes, how do we convert this equation or this exponential equation into the form of the equation of a line? So here's where logarithms become useful. We start with this function, y equals a times e to the power of bx. And first we take the log of both sides. Now, because we have e as our base number here, it makes sense to use natural log instead of log base 10. So we're going to use ln in this case. So we take ln of y on the left side and then ln of that whole expression, which is a times e to the power of bx. Now we can then use the addition property of log because we have log of a product. We can set, split that into the ln of a plus the ln of e to the power of bx. And then on this side, we can use that power property of law to take the bx, move it to the back side here, and so it becomes bx times ln e. And lastly, we can say that, well, ln e using the identity property is equal to 1, so then that's just bx. So we have ln y equals ln a plus bx. If we rewrite that a little bit to make it look like this, ln y is equal to bx plus ln a, that actually is a line equation. So it might not be obvious to you, but if I point out how it matches a line equation form, you should be able to see it. So your ln y in this case is just your y in the line equation, the y-axis value. Your b is now representing the slope. Remember, the b here comes from the original b in the exponential function, okay? So it's not the b that you'll see later that represents the y-intercept of a line, right? So this b means something else in the exponential function. So that b now becomes your slope in your line. The x is still the x. The ln of a, which is the other constant, is now your y-intercept, okay? So that's how you can convert an exponential function into a linear form. So what that means is that you're basically taking something that looks like this, and you're replotting it with different y and x value such that you get this shape. Now, if we apply this operation of converting exponential to a linear with that function that I gave you earlier, with that first order kinetics, the function that has that shape is this function right here, which is concentration of A, which is the reactant at some time E, is equal to the initial concentration, which is A naught times E to the power of negative KT. So that's the exponential form of the equation. If I go through the same steps here, so I take natural law on both sides and then do all this stuff I did here mathematically, what I end up getting at the end as a linear form of this function is the following ln of a equals to negative kt plus ln of a naught. So again, what that tells you is that I basically can take this function that has the exponential form and convert it into a linear form by plotting instead of a natural log of a, the x-axis stays the same as time, and that would give me this shape right here. Now, the advantage of this is now I know that the slope of this line here should equal to negative k, right? The negative of this constant. This happens to be called the right constant. And then the y-intercept, which is on this side, should equal the value of the ln of a naught. So that's how we would do linearization of an exponential function. And you will see this being applied a few times in general chemistry too.